right, welcome back, everyone. We're in Genesis chapter 8. When we left off, Noah had taken the cover off the ark, popped his head out, sent out the raven, sent out the dove, the waters begin to recede. Th that's actually been a question, where do the waters go? And uh, I think recently, geologists have found that there's more water beneath the earth than they originally thought, which is not terribly shocking to us, because Moses tells us that's one of the places the water went, was back down below. So yeah, some evaporated, but um, a lot of that evaporated water doesn't make it here. Yeah, so we're ready to start uh, Genesis 8.20. But before we get there, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that your wrath against sin is just, that you are right, in fact, to hate sin. Help us then also to hate sin, as you have told us in your scriptures that the beginning of wisdom is the hatred of evil. So teach us then to abhor our sin and the sin around us, not to participate in it. But help us especially to remember your goodness, to remember your covenant, and to remember the grace that you extended to Noah, even as you extend to us in baptism. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Okay, so we left off Genesis 8, 19. Noah had opened the cover, but it was a little while yet before they could leave the ark. The Lord himself opened the side of the ark. Not incidental, right? Um, and then the occupants, Noah his sons, their wives, and the animals leave the ark. Now, what, what we know of animals is that the minute that door is open, what happens? <laughs> the animals are gone, never to be seen. Creation was a little different at this time regarding man and animals, and we're going to see that here in these verses. So beginning in verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease." So, it begins with Noah building an altar. This is the first instance we have in the scriptures of an altar. What's an altar? Yeah, you make sacrifices, right? What does the word itself mean? Well, uh, what does that word look like? Altitude? Altimeter? Right? What's that? It's, 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 a, it's a high place, a lifted up place, right? Um, when, when there are altars built to idols in the temple in Jerusalem, they're often called the high places, right? In terms of the furniture in our nave and, and chancel, what's the highest point? It's the altar. I mean, there's a credence behind it, but um, why is the altar lifted up? It's not just showmanship. Oh, if you don't lift them up, they can't see. No, 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 no. There's something much, much more profound going on. The altar is lifted up, not only because it's ergonomic, not only so people can see, but because this is where things are happening. This is where God is present with his people. And so an altar is, is a lifted up place. An altar is a neutral term, by the way, because the pagans have altars too, to their, to their false gods. What they sacrifice on their altars is an abomination. 
either be go ahead yes the cross is definitely an altar and what does jesus say i when i am lifted up will draw all men to myself so um when pagans sacrifice on their altar their sacrifice is an abomination either because what is being sacrificed is forbidden like for example what do pagans like to sacrifice children babies yeah um that's an abomination i mean we we all recognize that or we should um or what's being sacrificed is not itself an abomination but the attitude of the sacrifice is is one of unbelief right now cain and, and abel give sacrifices they're not described as having altars but they give sacrifices Cain's was rejected not because what he sacrificed was bad but because he did it without faith okay so noah builds an altar and again i mean this shows you the kind of man noah is it also shows you how profoundly one is affected by spending the better part of a year in a boat um being one of the only ones that escapes God's wrath. Yes, in the Christian church, what are the sacrifices we make? Well, as Lutherans, we certainly reject the canon of the Mass, right? We are not sacrificing Jesus on the altar. But we do present sacrifices like, uh, she mentioned offerings, the prayers that, that we offer, the praises that we offer, when you sing, yeah, God gave you that voice, when you use it to sing His praises, you are making a sacrifice. Well, this is the thing, right? God gives differently to different people. And for some of us, we can get a noise out of our mouth and there's not much else. I mean, that's, that's where I was about when I was in high school. I don't know why I could play a brass instrument, which meant I could hear the note before I played it. You have to. I don't know why I didn't like immediately transfer that to singing, but it just, something didn't click. If that's what you got, use it. If the Lord gives you a wonderful singing voice that everyone acknowledges, use that. What, I mean, whatever the Lord gave you, use it. That's kind of the heart of Christian stewardship. You're just giving back to God what he first gave to you. So if it's money, money. If it's time, time. If it's prayer, you know, whatever it is. Um, so... Noah, his, his first impulse is, having survived all of this, having been shown this grace, he is going to call on the Lord. He's going to build an altar, and as the father of the nations that proceed from out of the ark, his intention is that they remain faithful to the Lord. And so he builds an altar. And notice, where are the clean animals? He doesn't have to round them up. And they, they, haven't, they haven't bolted, right? They're, they're, still, they're still there, right? Um, and, and what does Noah sacrifice? Yeah, some of the clean animals, some of the clean birds, right? Um, and again, what this, this is... This and the previous chapter are, are where we first encounter this concept of clean versus unclean. Um, there are entire chapters of books like Leviticus dedicated to that which is clean, that which is unclean. And that will become more formally um, codified later. But the concept is even much more ancient than just the writing of the books of Moses. Some animals are clean, some animals are unclean, right? And that which is clean is to be offered to the Lord. Why? I mean, first of all, the Lord is the one who commanded this distinction, right? Seven pairs of the clean animals, one pair of the unclean. So the distinction comes from the Lord. It teaches us, though, that sacrifices, the, the, the character of the sacrifice matters. 
the sacrifice has to be unblemished, right? All of that is leading up to what? Yeah, the incarnate Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. An unblemished, young, male, firstborn. Everything that's true of the sacrifices that are pleasing to God is true in the highest of Jesus. Okay. So, what happens when Noah makes the sacrifices? God found it pleasing. Yeah. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Yeah. Now, on the one hand, the, 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 smell of, the smell of roasting meat is pleasing just in general. But that's not quite what Moses is describing. What does it mean that the aroma is pleasing to the Lord? No. You said incense. What does incense have to do with this? Why is incense a pleasing smell? Yeah, it's... Oh. Right. Because incense rising up is the prayers of the saints, right? So, I mean, you were entirely right, by the way. Um, the incense rises before him, right? Let my prayer rise before thee as incense, right? Um, and often in church services, incense is used during the prayers to indicate the prayers of the saints rising up to the Lord and, and being to him a fragrant smell, a sweet smell, right? Likewise, abominations unto the Lord are often described as a foul stench. And what does a foul stench make you want to do? A avoid everything to do with it, right? Because a foul stench, it, it pollutes everything. Everything is polluted by it, and, and you want to be far away from it. Very instructive, because there are those that the Lord finds to be a foul stench, and there are those that the Lord finds to be a sweet-smelling aroma. The question is, what's the distinction Throughout the Bible, the constant refrain is, of course, faith. Um, that's the distinction between Cain and Abel's sacrifice. That's the distinction between those in the ark and those outside the ark. That's the distinction between the sheep and the goats. Faith. So, Noah offers the sacrifice. It's a sweet-smelling aroma because Noah offers it in faith. I mean, that was the virtue that, that drove him to build the ark in the first place, right? By faith, Noah built the ark. Okay. So then the Lord says in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. This is fascinating to me because that's the exact reason that he struck the ground in the first place. Because man's heart is only evil all the time. All evil, all the time, 24-7, no commercial interruptions, just nothing but pure evil. The Lord strikes the ground because of it. I mean, original sin is an article of faith, but it's the one that you can actually prove. I mean, have you, have you met a person? They'll show you they're a sinner. Um, children are no different. Their sins are not quite as guileful. They're not as sly. They're real. Um, so the Lord's relationship with man changes in a couple of directions. First of all, prior to the flood, it seems like the Lord is spending time dwelling on the earth, talking with, with people like Noah. It's not really going to happen much after the flood, although it certainly will happen with people like Abraham and Moses. Um, and then, of course, in the person of Jesus with many, many, many people. But um, <clears throat> it's not quite the same as Adam walking with God in the garden um, or the people that get to converse directly with him. On the other hand, man is now going to call on the Lord. That is, in a, in a formal sort of way, worship the Lord through sacrifice and prayer. And 
now the Lord has promises, he's not going to strike down every living thing as he had done. As he had done. That'll be important later. Chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, teem on the earth and multiply in it. Okay, not the first time we've heard this command, be fruitful and multiply, but God gives it to the man and his his sons and their wives, be fruitful and multiply, which is just to say, have babies, right? So this is not a command only given prior to the fall or only prior to the flood. This is given before the fall, before the flood, after the flood. And it's reiterated again and intensified after the flood here in verse 7, not only be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, team on the earth. Make the earth teem with human beings. So all that garbage that we heard throughout the 19th century, throughout the 1970s, about the earth is overpopulated. You know what happened just about the time that earth began, began to be overpopulated? The Weber process of creating ammonia. And what happens now that we can manufacture ammonia? What happens to crop yields? When I was a kid, the 100 bushel club was a thing in the Midwest. 100 bushels of corn an acre was a feat. Now, I mean, if you're not getting twice that, you're just, you're, you're not doing it right. It's like as, as, as the population of the earth has increased, the Lord has blessed man with the ability to feed that many mouths. It's almost like God is real. And God actually does preserve and defend his creation. Shag, sh you know, shattering, just staggering sorts of things, right? But, I mean, yeah, and, and, and some of the blessings that we have seem mundane to us, but they're nonetheless God-given. I mean, again, the fact that children, they ask what's for dinner, not why are we going to eat. Why is that? Or, or you know, are we going to eat tonight? Why is that? Because the Lord brings it about that parents have jobs and receive money and there's, you know, there's food on the shelves. It doesn't always work perfectly. Yes, true. But, so, look at verse 2. Here's another thing that changes. Now, man's, man's relationship with the rest of creation, in particular the beasts, the animals, is going to change. And the reason is because of what's coming later. The fear of you, that is, animals' fear of mankind, will be on every beast of the earth. So every beast knows what's about to happen. And that is this. Into your hand they are delivered. Now, man always had dominion over the animals, right? What did the Lord not give them? Authorization to eat the animals. That doesn't mean that the sons of Cain didn't eat animals. They very well may have. But this is when the Lord authorizes that. And verse 2 makes it clear, the animals know it. What would it be like to deal with animals, but they're not afraid of you? Every bull a golden retriever. <laughs> Actually, if, to have one jump on your lap would probably hurt. But um, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. One of my favorite videos I've ever seen online is this guy sitting at a, at a salmon um, run. 
And this grizzly just comes up and sits next to him and looks out over the same bluff that the guy's looking out over. And the grizzly's just sitting there. I mean, you can almost imagine the grizzly turning over like, hey, you going to hand me one of them beers or what? It's beautiful because a grizzly bear is a fierce animal. I mean, we want to stay hundreds of yards away from those things. And here comes this one, and he's, he's not attacking the man. He just comes and sits down. What's it like for creation to work like that? It's be- it sounds beautiful, but I've never experienced it. Because we all live after Genesis 9-2, where every beast of the field knows they have been delivered in a man's hand. And now they have a fear of man. And so... Now, this is part of Adam's curse. You have dominion over the animals, but they're going to make things difficult because they know they're given into your hand. So they're going to resist. So, um, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Right? This is now where the Lord gives the authorization. You may eat the animals now. However, there is one stipulation in verse 4. The one thing you are not to eat, and that is flesh that still has its life in it. That is to say, it's blood. There are a couple things going on here. One, there have been instances of like nomadic tribes carving out a piece of a living camel and then eating that flesh and then packing it back up with with mud and healing up. That's, I mean, so unspeakably cruel. But... As we note from Acts 15, this is something that's going to persist even into the New Testament era. Um, no, you shouldn't eat blood sausage because it's nasty. <laughs> so, um, I don't know much about how it's made. Is it, is it made from like strangled meat? Oh, yeah, that's gross. So in, in Acts chapter 15, if you remember, remember, this is called the Council of Jerusalem, right? The early church is still kind of headquartered in Jerusalem, and they're wondering about the integration of the Jewish Christians and the, the Gentile converts. And there's the question of, well, do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to abstain from eating unclean foods? What about the, the clothing that they wear? Um, how's all that going to work? How's the temple going to work? How's the priesthood going to work? And at the Council of Jerusalem that was headed by St. James, he's kind of the, the bishop of Jerusalem, what they determined was, no, we do not insist upon circumcision. That sign has been fulfilled in Christ. But the Gentiles need to do two things. One, do not eat strangled meat. Two, Abstain from sexual immorality. Well, there's something going... I mean, one, as a process of butchering, it's kind of brutal, but there's something more, too, and that is God is teaching us that the life of the animal is in the blood. It's not a physiology lesson. He's teaching us about sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins. There has to be shedding of blood for sins to be forgiven which means that the sacrifice must lose its life. And so he's going to teach throughout, um, throughout the books of Moses, the life of the animal is in the blood. That's true both of man and of, of, of animals. So um, the, the interstitial fluid between the cells and muscle tissue is not blood. Correct me, please, if... if <laughs> right. But... Um, it, it, is, it is pinkish red, but it's not blood. Yes. Yes. The Lord's Supper is a great place to go to because what do we do? We drink its blood. We, we, drink, we drink our Lord's blood. Which was, I mean, I mean as, as far as signs of the new covenant go, it was shocking. It's, it's, um, it's a, yeah, it's kosher is a, is you, you can pay a service to come and certify that your process is performed according to their ideas, whatever they are. And 
then you, then you get to put the little yeah. logo on your, your food. So as you know, I worked for a poultry company and I, I toured one of their, their live processing plants where live birds came in and um, whole birds processed came out, right? Um, when the live birds were hung on the line, this line was proce being processed halal. And that required that prayers be spoken over the live animal before they're slaughtered. Now, because Muslims have no concept of what we would call faith, as long as the sound of the prayer is heard by the bird, that's good enough. And so there was a 1980s rap boombox sitting on a stainless steel stool playing a tape on a loop. This, ah, ah, ah. I mean, as, as the birds are going by the stool, and then because they paid for that service, they could put the halal logo on their processed chicken. As if it wasn't indignity enough to be hanging upside down on those shackles, I got to go by the 1980s boombox. Verse 5, yes, and for your lifeblood, because remember, he's talking to mankind, and we have blood in our veins too, and arteries. Um, so, we have life that can be shed as well. For your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. That is, if someone kills a human being, there must be a reckoning. If it's an animal, it must be put to death. If it's a human being... He must be put to death. The Lord is commanding capital punishment. Now the Roman church insists that capital punishment is ungodly, but don't ask me as a Lutheran pastor to explain why the Roman church is not following the Bible. <laughs> um, it, it is, it's part of proportionality, right? It's, it's not, if someone insults you, kill him. Lamech. I mean, that's, that's how things were before the flood, right? I killed a guy for insulting me. You're brutal. On the other hand, what, hypothetically, what would happen if you lived in a society where evil doesn't get punished? Hypothetically. It's miserable. You scream out for justice. When, oh Lord, will there be justice for this? This can't remain unsettled. It's, this is why when we list the good gifts of God and creation, good government, justice, and peace are among the things that we praise God for when we have them because it's intolerable when you don't. And even when everyone in general has pretty good justice, it's still intolerable if one person is left with an unsettled injustice. It's a big deal. Yeah, I've done enough with PCR to, to know how, uh, how much I trust DNA tests. So, um, that phrase appears so many times in the confessions. The abuse of a thing does not negate its rightful use, right? Yes, the death penalty can be misapplied. And it's a grave injustice when that happens, which means when that sentence is handed down, you better be sure. That's why in Christendom we have the, the concept of the jury has to come to a unanimous decision. We still have that, um, but those 12 people could be, they're supposed to be your peers, but the chance that they think like you is low. Um, but the idea is if, if, if you're going to sentence someone to something that, that stark, you better be sure. That's also a good responsibility if you serve on a jury. If, 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 if the standard of proof, if the burden of evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt, if you have a reasonable doubt, you need to say so. Do not just go along with the crowd. And if they don't like you, you have, you have far more important duty to the defendant than you do to people liking you. Verse 8. <clears throat> then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, 
As many came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So God is going to establish a covenant with not only Noah and not only his sons, and that is the nations that come forth from Noah, but also with the beasts of the earth. So, never again will he destroy the earth in the manner that he did in the days of Noah. Now, what, again, what did we say a covenant was? It's a promise, right? This is what I'm going to do for you. So, um, there are different ways that covenants can be established. When a covenant is, is established between men, yeah, you take an animal, you cut it in half, and you walk through the blood and say, if I break this, I, sh I should be like that animal is, right? As a matter of fact, in Hebrew, you don't establish a covenant. Again, establish is an abstract word. You cut a covenant. Um, so yeah, I mean, excellent point. We are, yeah, verse 12. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So, the bow... And that's the same word as the, as the weapon, right? Because, you know, remember, bow is, if you're a fiddle player, a bow is not a weapon unless you're really, you know, feisty. But um, <laughs> the, the bow is a weapon, right? It's, it's, it's a weapon, it's a, it's a fierce weapon because you can kill someone you're not close to. So the Lord has a bow, that is, he has weapons. The Lord can destroy. Ask Noah. When the bow is set in the clouds, it means it's not aimed at mankind. It's set up. He's, he's not exercising his weapons in, in wrath. He's showing mercy. <clears throat> so, that bow is a sign of the covenant between the Lord and the earth, man, and the beasts. Yeah, this, this is the thing, right? Is that this is, this is the sign that gets co-opted to defend sodomy and all, all kinds of other perversions that are adequately described in Romans 1. Um, <clears throat> but this is what the devil does, right? He takes that which is godly and, and inverts it, perverts it for evil. On the one hand, I'm really skittish about anything that has a rainbow on it. On the other hand, we can't really abandon it because it's the Lord's sign. I, I will note that for most of the time, whenever the, the, the rainbow flag is used as, as you know, defending perversion, it tends to have six stripes, whereas the Lord's rainbow has seven colors. Um, there's something to that, I think. Seven being a number of completeness, perfection, Six being the number of man. Roy G. Biv was a Christian. So you, you, you think the rainbow reminds God? No, 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 no. You're right, because it's precisely what he says in the next verses. No, you were entirely right. Because look at what he says. This, this is the most fantastic thing, I think. He says, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So we think of covenants and as having signs. As a matter of fact, in, in theology, the, the sacraments are often dealt with under the, the, the heading of signs. And not just by like sacramentarians that don't think they do anything, but, but even you know, the ancient church used that term because baptism has a sign, namely water. The Lord's Supper has signs, bread and wine. The Old Covenant had the sign of circumcision. 
the covenant with Noah has the sign of the bow, right? And of course, when we see the bow, we remember, okay, the, the Lord once destroyed all of creation, so we should fear his wrath. However, he also gave grace to Noah and his sons. So, you know, the Lord has promised never again to destroy the earth by a flood. But God says, when I set the bow, I'm going to see it and I will remember. Now, that, that doesn't mean that God is forgetful. He's omniscient. What it does mean is when he remembers the covenant, he's preparing for action. In other words, he will act in creation to enact the covenant that he established with Noah. So, for example, he will send forth his spirit on the earth to call forth sinners to repentance to preserve the remnant that he intends to preserve throughout all time. That remnant, he promises, will always be there. Right, and right, we should. It's, I mean, it's, it's beautiful for one thing. He, he picked a very beautiful sign. But yeah, you're right. We see it and, and we do remember. Right. Yeah, and, and when we get to Genesis 10, we'll see that, that wickedness will persist again. It also reminds us that if, if the Lord sees the, the bow in the, in the clouds and he himself remembers the covenant, it means he's faithful to his promise. When, when, when the Lord promises something, he keeps the promise. Yeah, the Lord says, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So, and, and, and of course, such a beautiful sign used for such a, an important promise, it's why it is so offensive for it to be perverted. Because here you have people engaging in sin, yes, but willful sin of a nature that is utterly perverse and an abomination unto the Lord, the kind that is described as, as Romans 1, the Lord giving people over to their lusts, they receive in the body the, their penalty for their perversions, that sort of thing being associated with the sign of the covenant between God and Noah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's blasphemy of the highest order. And for such a thing to be found in places that call themselves Christian is unspeakable. I mean, in, in, in the large catechism, we're told that even common blasphemers should be put to the sword. How, how much more for those who are engaged in such willful blasphemy? I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that good king, I mean, even kings like Hezekiah would destroy because they knew the kind of wrath that it brings down upon the earth. Yeah, right, yeah. Th yeah. Then they identify themselves by the sin of pride, which of course is actually the subject of the sermon, believe it or not. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the most grotesque sins because it places yourself in the place of God. Right. So, as much as I would love to dig into the next few verses, we don't have the time to really do it justice. So we'll stop here. Next week we'll dig in with the descendants of Noah, the table of the nations. I, I, I loaded my mind just in case we got to those verses and my brain is like kind of, it's overpacked. I'll just preface it by saying that if when you get to Bible chapters that are full of names, you skip Genesis 10, you missed a lot. Well, you will explain it. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through it. But um, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.